We would consider the fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer in our sermon this evening. And as the Catechism expounds, especially the second part, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, we would take note of the Catechism's instruction. That that means that uh, the whole thing means because of Christ's blood, we're praying that God would not impute to us, poor sinners, that we are any of the transgressions we do or the evil that constantly clings to us. And then especially this, forgive us just as we are fully determined as evidence of your grace in us wholeheartedly to forgive our neighbors. And thus far we read the Catechism's explanation of forgiveness, our praying for forgiveness and our praying for forgiveness as we forgive one another. And for this, we want to turn back to the epistle of John, the first epistle of John in chapter 2, where John sets forth something that is a fundamental fact of our life. We are forgiven for his name's sake in verse 12. But the first 12 verses we would read, or let's read the first 14. My little children, 1 John 2, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk, just as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you've known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you've overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you've known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you've known him who is from the beginning. And I've written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. As far we read the epistle of John to the little children, who were evidently those he had begotten again in the faith by the word that he brought in the Holy Spirit working, the new birth among the little children that he writes among the people of God uh, to whom he wrote in the first century. Beloved, we are those considering the fifth petition that we pray to our Father who is in heaven, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And we're considering this in light of what John has reminded us in 1 John 2.12, that he's writing to us little children in general, because our sins are forgiven us for his name's sake. This we take as a basis for our understanding and perspective of the fifth petition, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We pray this because our sins are forgiven us for his name's sake. We pray for forgiveness and that we might be forgiven as we forgive others for Our sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Now, to begin this sermon, uh, having begun it already, but to continue the beginning, I want to uh, tell you that you know, and, and I know as well, because we have the Bible, we know the troubles of this world. We know the origin of the troubles of the world, and we know the nature of the troubles, and we know the outcome of the troubles of this world. And the origin and the nature and the outcome of the troubles of the world are because the world is the world of the unforgiven. 
The world is the world of sinners who are in Adam, and that's what the Bible means by the world, which we're not to love. The world is full of sinners who are not forgiven, and they're under, therefore, the wrath of God. And the real problem is not some virus or some uh, candidate, not one, but the real problem is that sinners are in the hands of an angry God. Rebellious sinners are in the hands of an angry God who is holy and who cannot behold iniquity except to punish it. Rebellious sinners are those who reject, whenever this comes to them, the gospel of Jesus Christ as the only way out, and they persist in their rejection of the solution of solutions. Indeed, the solution to the pandemic, I dare say, the the solution to the social unrest, The solution as well to broaden this and narrow it at the same time to your problems and mine is forgiveness. If you think of it, the world that is the world of the unforgiven shows that it's unforgiven in making its troubles worse in foolish policies not only, but in various ways showing its rebelliousness and foolishness against God. This is even in things temporal, political, economic, and otherwise, and especially religious. In other words, the fact of being unforgiven drives people into foolish, unforgiven sorts of conclusions and procedures and uh, prospects of solutions to its unforgiveness and to its viruses. But now, on the contrary, even as we are led to believe here in this sacred word of John, We are forgiven, and that is everything to us. Having our sins lifted off is the greatest thing. It is the peace of God that we so desperately need and seek. It is the way to piety in this world, deliverance from the fear of death that holds in bondage those who are not forgiven all the day long. It is the solution to all the problems of sin in this world, to our perspective on the virus and the pandemic and everything else, it is everything. That's why John writes, I write to you, little children, I have even more to say to you, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. That to John was everything. That to us should be everything. We are written to and now spoken to by God through the Apostle John and through yours truly, your servant and ambassador of the gospel, because our sins are forgiven us. We have this wonderful beginning. We have this justification before God. We have this right to be the people of God because of the blood of Jesus and the own honor and name of God is at stake in reminding us of this and in establishing and continuing to establish this truth in our lives, this forgiveness of sins, and so that everything about our lives has to do with our being forgiven, even our forgiving one another's. And that is the idea of this uh, petition of Jesus as we pray, forgive us our debts, as we forgive one another, We do this because we're forgiven, and we do this because we would confirm our forgiveness in our forgiving one another. We want to confirm that we are forgiven and that God will forgive us as we go about representing God and forgiving one another. So I want to consider two points at this uh, part in our uh, exegesis of the text and our explanation of the Catechism and the Lord's Prayer. First of all, that because we're forgiven, we forgive. Secondly, that because we're forgiven, we are blessed in the way of God forgiving us and answering our prayers and our forgiving one another. Well, beloved, forgiveness. You know what this is all about? We've talked about how we're forgiven. Our sins are released uh, by God. They are no longer something that can be held by God himself against us. The wrath of God is burned out on Calvary, and the the guilt of all our transgressions is principally destroyed there. Our guilt is destroyed on Calvary 
when the wrath of God consumed the Son and our sins that were on His shoulders. Amazing work of atonement. And when Jesus said, it is finished, He was referring exactly to that. It, the work of atonement, the salvation of the Lamb was finished. Well, we are those as well who continually have sin, and there is a kind of guilt that accrues to our account as we continually sin every day, and we must therefore pray that God would forgive us that. But it's not like we need continual atonement. The atonement is done. That wrath of God is taken away. That guilt is taken away, and our justification before God is established forever. Nothing you can do or Satan can do can undo the work of the cross. Our faith and our unbelief really have nothing to do with that work of atonement, except that God, through the gift of the faith of the Holy Spirit that applies to our account, that forgiveness, applies all of that merit of Christ to us. But as we daily become dirty, we need cleansing, and the application of the guilt that's of the, uh, the justification on the cross to our account. And that's what the prayer means when we pray for forgiveness. But we do have to be praying that we would also forgive others. Now, how John expresses this in 1 John is that our forgiving one another because we're forgiven takes the form generally of love. The Apostle John is the Apostle of love. And this is what he writes, for example, in 1 John 2, verse 9, when he says, He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, this is something that Jesus is getting at when he has given the Lord's Prayer as he did you're for, to forgive. Pray for forgiveness as you forgive those who sin against you. You're to love them. You're to show off the reality of your understanding of forgiveness and that there is forgiveness with God as you love your neighbor. And that love, of course, would take the form of loving that neighbor who sins and even the one who sins against you. And forgiveness is the, the ultimate expression of the love of Christ. So when John speaks of that, this is what he's saying. And he's motivating the people to be those who confirm their being Christian and their fact that they are forgiven in their life. He wants to say, in other words, that the theory of your theology, the doctrine you have maybe in your creeds, must somehow be a reality on the ground. And this is among sinners, even as the reality of God's own forgiveness of you was shown in Christ incarnate, on the ground, in a womb, in a tomb, and everything in between, forgiving sinners, even though they maligned him and ultimately crucified him. This is the idea of John. And uh, if we look further on in the Apostle John's epistle here, um, he speaks of this love as the manifestation of our knowing forgiveness and which would come out in our forgiving one another. 1 John 3, 16, for example, we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has his world goods and sees his brother in need shuts up his heart from him. He, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let's not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And, and on he goes in 1 John 4, and, uh, and verse 20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he does not love his brother whom he has seen. How can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also. Well, beloved, love, love for one another is how we show that we are loved. And if God has shown his love in forgiving us, this is how we show our love. We forgive one another. Those even who trespass against us, who spit upon us, who take away our rights, our reputation, who take off the shirt of our, off our back, who, who, who hurt us and our children and so on, these are the things we must do if we are to show 
that we are those who believe in this uh, word from heaven. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We are to forgive one another, and that's an expression of love. Oh, beloved, this is not new. It's not just John, the apostle of love, who writes about this, but um, in the Bible, we read of this forgiving sort of love, for example, in Leviticus 19, Leviticus 19, 17 and 18. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. That's the idea here in forgiving the unlovable. Here, loving the brethren is loving those who aren't so easy to forgive or to love and even uh, needing forgiveness. I'm thinking, for example, of Proverbs 10, verse 12. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. That's alluding to the New Testament fact of love covering the multitude of sins, as Peter says, or love thinking no evil in 1 Corinthians 13. Without this love, we're nothing, and without this love, we cannot really say that we are forgiven. We must forgive one another. This is so vitally important. Jesus, in fact, says you must forgive one another, and if you don't, you will not be forgiven. We pray, Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And Jesus reminds us, if you do not do this, you are those who cannot say you're Christian. You cannot say or be assured of the fact either that God will forgive you in the day of judgment. And so there's something absolutely vital about this forgiving one another. Now, what does this mean? What does it mean to forgive one another? We've all talked about this, haven't we? Because we all have things that are bad in our lives and things and people that have done nasty things to us in our lives. And even if it's our sister or brother, uh, we've lived at least uh, that much to know uh, not everybody is for us all the time. And so we have to deal with problems, people problems, people in our lives. Maybe some of you are dealing with people in your lives who've dealt harshly with you. Somebody beat you up in the playground, which happened in certain uh, public schools that I went to. And so what does this all mean? What does it mean that we are to forgive one another? Well, I want to say, first of all, that forgiveness <coughs> is an official act of us Christians. Now, that's designed, I'm saying it this way, to put it, everything into perspective. We are forgiven, and we are forgiven to forgive others on behalf of God. We represent God when we forgive other sinners. God forgives sinners on His behalf. We shall forgive sinners. And that means we are to represent Him who only can forgive and do it the way He does it. We are to forgive freely and unconditionally because certainly God doesn't forgive you because you've merited anything. So we forgive others when they wrong us freely and unconditionally. Don't hold grudges. As well, we are those who forgive in a holy way. We forgive unconditionally, but doesn't mean we just sweep sin under the rug and say, well, it doesn't really amount to much. No, we want to do this in a holy way and seek reconciliation if this is possible. Besides that, just as God, representing God, we seek the best of the neighbor. We don't seek their hurt. We are kind to one another, forgiving one another, as Ephesians 4.32 says. And we are to do this as those who are on behalf of God. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. That's so very important. We're on behalf of God. So it's an attitude of mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Those who on behalf of God show the kind of God He is. And by this, we stand in the wonderful behalf of the wonderful name of Jesus. Now, at the same time, we represent God. We are letting God Himself be God. With regard to our anger and our quest for vengeance, for example, we're letting God take care of that. But also, with regard to forgiveness, we're not imagining for a minute that we ourselves actually 
lift off the sins of people and take off their guilt before God. Oh no, that's a mistake. When we forgive others, we do this on behalf of God who alone can actually forgive sinners. We are representing the God who forgives in the way of repentance and so on, but we don't actually take away their debts, but we show kindness as the one who would know uh, forgiveness of God and have others know this as well. There is in, in, as well something that we may not think happens when we forgive others automatically. That is this. Let's say somebody sins against me or sins against you and you have not uh, talked to that person and they haven't talked to you. There's a kind of forgiveness that you must show. We call it an attitudinal forgiveness. An attitudinal forgiveness. You must want reconciliation. You must want to show mercy. You must want the best for them. You must want to be brought back together if you were once brethren or sisters in Christ. This is so very important. However, there is not full reconciliation unless there is this transactional forgiveness, a meeting of people and a repentance and a sorrow for sin. This has to take place, for example, in the Church of Christ. If someone sins in the Church of Christ and there is no transactional forgiveness, there's no sorrow for sin and admission of guilt, maybe appearing before the Church and confessing sin, then there cannot be reconciliation. In fact, in the exercise of the keys of the kingdom, those who persist in their sin, even though we want them to be forgiven and we're, we're kind to them, nevertheless are still under the wrath of God because they are in their sins and they're holding on to it. And God forbid, but this happens when the church ex excommunicates people, that's pronouncing as close as it can be to heaven itself that God himself is holding them to be unforgiven. And we're to consider them as heathen and publican, out, out, publicans outside the kingdom of, of God. And so we must not be as God. We let God be as God, even though we're representing God in our seeking um, to forgive one another and in our actually forgiving them in our minds and in our attitudes. Now, there's lots of difficult things around here. Let me deal with some of them. Lots of hindrances. I've had them. Maybe you've had them in your life of dealing with irascible, difficult sorts of people. I once had an elder, for example, warn me that uh, of a certain person uh, uh, in another congregation with whom I had difficulties. And this person was an older person, cantankerous, and, and this person, this elder said, was obnoxious. <laughs> and, obnox and I was a young buck, and I said, oh, you ought not to say that older so-and-so because that's not fair. And, yeah, about a week later, I said, you're right, he's obnoxious. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is life. Uh, so we dealt with that, an obnoxious person, and still kindly and still um, seeking the good of that person. This is what you run up against, and sometimes even wives run up against that with husbands who are obnoxious and who you know, have, have a, a problem. But we can get up on, hung up on these things. Um, and we can have someone's obnoxiousness interfere with the kindness of God in us. That may never be. Because then we're showing that sin is more powerful than piety and that sin is more powerful than the blood of Jesus that cleanses from all sins. So don't, I'm dealing with the hindrances and also the solutions to difficult problems in forgiving. There's another thing that uh, we can get hung up on, and that's just things in people's lives and things about persons and their personalities. So they do certain things that irk you, and you just hold a grudge because of it. Maybe they eat a certain way, or maybe they do this or don't do that and, and don't hang up their clothes and all of this stuff, and you hold that against them as if that were sin, but it's just a foible. It, it could be involved and related to sin, but we have now switched definitions of sin very subtly and said anything that irks us is a sin. And, and, but we have trouble forgiving that sin because it's not really a sin, it's just a habit or it's just a way that they were raised and, and we, we can't really do anything about it. 
But uh, we're talking about forgiven, uh, being forgiven and forgiving debts or sin debts. And uh, this is so very important. We can as well, if we're seeking to uh, pray this prayer and we're not really sensitive to where we've been spiritually, we can be living in sin. And this is the first thing that happens when you're living in sin and you're walking in a uh, carnal way. And it could be in whatever area of your life. The first thing that happens just about always is that you hold a grudge against somebody else. You find a cause that you know that you're better at than that person and they can sin against you and you just hammer them or hammer them. And meanwhile, you haven't taken care of the sin in your own life. You haven't gone to the cross and sought forgiveness and, and you haven't melted before the truth that you're just a sinner. And here you're coming and posturing before, for, uh, before a poor person who's dared to cross your path and you're holding this against them. As in the parable in Matthew 18 of the, the one who was owed uh, who owed a lot to the ruler and he forgave him and then his servant came, owed him just a little bit and he held it against him. And that's not good at all. In fact, that's worthy of hell. When we don't know how much we've forgive, been forgiven and maybe we're walking in that sin and then we go about lashing at others who owe us debts and this is not right at all. Uh, another thing about our problem with forgiving is that we do not uh, show ourselves sensitive to where sinners come from. And this is uh, very important, and it has to do with the subtleties of being active and real in our forgiving people. Very important that we know we live, for example, in a broken world. And in a broken world, not only are marriages broken and homes broken, but parents no longer know how to raise their children. And so the children don't know how to be proper and respectful and kind and so on. And they can lash out and they can just be ornery and so on. And they're undisciplined in a, in a great big way. Well, when we deal with people like that, even in the Church of Christ, it's very important to know where they come from. To know maybe they've had a broken childhood. Maybe they've been abused and so on. That's the way they are. That's why they act the way they do. And and they sin against me. They've never really thought about this as sin and thought about their, their attitude and so on as sinful. We have to understand them. Love comes down to a person and truly seeks understanding, seeks pity, seeks to be those who are reconciled in their mind of where this person is at. Remember Jesus came and he sat among the sinners and the publicans and he wasn't among the scribes and the Pharisees who were looking down, on, down the nose at these people. He was one who was with them, seeking to work repentance, but with them where they were at. In this world, beloved, we must understand the world. And that's one worldling at a time. That's your neighbor, one worldling neighbor as a time, at a time understand them, seek to know where they're at, why they do the things they're at, why they're so irascible, why they're so unreasonable, and, and all of these things. And know that in the church as well. We are full of brokenness and we need all need healing from Jesus. And then there's another problem, it's called repeat offense. Oh, if people would just sin against me once, that's one thing, but they come again and again Remember Peter or somebody was saying to Jesus, how often should I forgive my neighbor? Should it be seven times? And he says, 70 times seven, meaning uh, infinitely. As often as they come to you and you, they say they're sorry, well, you forgive them. Well, that leads to this hindrance, and I've had it in my ministry. What if the person comes and says, well, I'm sorry, and doesn't really mean it? Well, you don't think they mean it. They have a half-hearted and... Uh, shuffling sort of look about them and attitude about them that says, I don't know if they really mean this. What if that's all you ever get out of them, as it were? And you want this whole long, uh, <laughs> this long expression, how much you sinned against me and how terrible this was, and they only give you this. What do you do with that? Especially when they're repeat offenders. Well, sometimes in the church, we've had to put people on probation who've come and they've been under discipline and you just don't take it for granted that it's real, they have to show it. 
But so many times in our life, we have to be those who are happy for something, happy that God in His way has worked in that person to be that way and at least come that far and not go away from us and, and so on. So this is, is hard, especially when you've been hurt. I remember a person, um, I think I was talking to somebody about this the other day, who was, who was raped, who stood up before the congregation and said they forgave their rapist. That was quite a humiliating thing for that young lady. There's a story of uh, Corey Ten Boom, who was a Jew who was persecuted and had her parents and so on, uh, who were killed and so on. And later on was at a convention and there was the Nazi who burned her parents in the furnace. And there was the Nazi who said, came up to her and said, please forgive me. Now what would you do? What would you do? Now, that's exactly the kind of forgiveness we're to give, isn't it? Exactly the kind of forgiveness that was given to us who crucified the Son of God. So for all of the forgivenesses, uh, the hindrances to forgiveness, we are to represent God and we are to not be as God, but to let God be God and to do this no matter what. And all because... We're forgiven. All because of that. It makes all the difference in the world. And if you think about that, beloved, that you are forgiven, that you are really forgiven, all your sins, and that John writes to you, and Jesus speaks to you, and the declaration of the gospel is presented to you in light of the fact that you have been forgiven, it should be no Big thing, no great hindrance for you to forgive others as you are forgiven. And that leads to the blessing. And the blessing is that there is, as we forgive others, and as we forgive them, that God answers our prayers and forgives us. And in that way, we are assured we are forgiven. Now, there's been no little squabble about that phrase. What does it mean, forgive us as we forgive our debtors? Does it mean that we want God to forgive us the same way that we forgive others, as if we forgave perfectly? Not that. It couldn't be that. Our forgiveness is not perfect. Could it be that we're seeking merit here? Look, God, we forgave others, therefore you should forgive us because we've earned something. That cannot be. You know why? This is a prayer, beloved. We're praying, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We're not demanding that our debts be forgiven because of how good we are. We're praying, we're begging God to forgive us. And simply, beloved, what this is, what this way of expressing this forgiveness that we seek from God and that we we ourselves exercise towards another, is simply our saying that we who are God's children do forgive others and we want God to recognize His own work in us. That's the idea. God our Father in heaven, forgive us our debts as you've given us grace to begin to forgive others. Forgive us our debts because we're your children and we act like your children, and we're seeking to act like your children, and this is our life, and this is our life, and now we're saying, please forgive us. Please lift off the debt of us, and please assure us as we're going about on your behalf forgiving others too. That's all that means. We seek to be confirmed and assured of God's own work in us as we forgive one another, that we shall be forgiven as well. And as we do this, beloved, we are assured. We are assured. And we, this is what John is writing about all the time here. If you love one another, you can, if you don't love one another, you cannot be sure that you're a Christian. If you do, you can be sure. And if you express your love by forgiving one another, in the hardest thing, 
then you surely shall be for, uh, uh, understand that you are loved of God and that you are forgiven. I want you to know this. I write these things to you because you are forgiven, and I write these things of your sanctification so that you may know this. I want it so that you know you're justified, you're right with God, and that you're sanctified, you're on the way of holiness leading to heaven. I want you to know this because the Father in heaven will not have his children in doubt, and John the Father will not have his children in doubt, and you fathers don't want your children in doubt, and the church fathers don't want the children of the church in doubt. The theology of doubt is anathema in the Christian church. We want this confirmation, and as we confess our faith, this is confirmed to us, and as we forgive our sins, our debtors, this is also confirmed to us. There's another thing that happens. Not only is the blessing that we are assured, but we are set free. There's a freedom that is attained through forgiving debtors. You know what happens when we hold a grudge? The grudge holds us. If any of you is holding a grudge, maybe your parents hold grudges. And children, you know by the talk at the dinner table, do your parents hold grudges? Tell one another about that. Mom and Dad, I wonder, respectfully, are grudges holding you? Are you living, and it's a constant reaction to what that person did to you in the eighth grade or last year? This is something that holds us. And it's a real thing. Hatred can, can kill us. And, and all this, oh, I wish that I could get even with that person, can really grip a person and a family in the generations. Be careful. What forgiving others does, truly, even if you're not completely reconciled, because maybe they haven't apologized, but you on your side have sought it, what that does is set you free set you free from the idolatry of playing God, of seeking to have the judgment day right now so that that person can get it and you'll be off free and you can have his house that he stole from you, you can have his land that he stole, you can have whatever that he stole from you back. Beloved, what is Christianity all about? It's not about our rights. Forgiving others, we, we give up the right to be king. We give up the right to be the one who decides what's right and wrong. We give up the right to be God. You see, when you're forgiving others, you're one who's saying, God is everything, God has forgiven me, and I'm just here to be a forgiver on the behalf of God, and I'm not here to establish my kingdom. I've just prayed your kingdom come and your will be done, and now I'm going to pray that my rights may be established? No, I'm praying that I may behave as a Christian. It's striking how many people there are who will be cast into prison at the end of time, the debtor's prison. That's the parable in Matthew 18, those who don't forgive others. But what's more striking and unknown is how many prisons there are of our own making before the judgment day. We enclose ourselves in our own emotions, our own rehearsed, maybe in the shower, spoken, speeches against the persons that we can't stand. Any of you like that? Beloved, I want to set you free and myself free today. We can be so strange in our unforgiveness. We have trouble forgiving God. We call it that. I don't know how I can forgive God. We call it that. But that's itself as idolatry. You can't forgive God. He's done nothing wrong. But because, you see, he made me this way, I'll never forgive him. 
Because he gave me these parents, I'll never forgive him. Because he made me and I'm so short, so tall, whatever, I'll never forget him. Forgive him. Because I wasn't dealt a full deck, I'll never forgive God. That's how people live in the church. And their life is one constant reaction. It's not action, it's reaction. They're never in control, except they're controlled by their emotions. And they would deal with other people. They can't even deal with God. And so when John writes, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven, that just sails over their heads. Because they can't forgive others. They can't forgive God. They can't leave off that yesterday, that argument, that bad grade they got, that demotion they got at work. Well, beloved, how are you doing receiving this sermon? How am I doing? It's only in the way of our forgiving others that we are forgiven. It's only in the way of our forgiving others that we can pray, Lord, forgive us our debts and know that we are assuredly forgiven. Do you know that? Do you know that? Theology on the ground, your ground, your earth, your neighborhood, your life, and mine. Then there's this great blessing. Not only the blessing of assurance and confirmation. You're going about forgiven because you're forgiven. You are forgiven. Not only freedom, you're free. But also this, God still speaks to you. Notice what Jesus or John says here. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I have something to say to you, something from heaven. And that's what God would say to us today. He's still speaking to us because our sins are forgiven, and we know that, and we're set free to forgive others. Now, that's a great thing, a great thing in this troubled world, the world of the unforgiven, whose state of guilt directs all of their pathway into foolishness and folly and hopelessness and despair and hell itself. But for those who are forgiven, God still speaks to us. He communicates to us. There's a divine apostolic com uh, communication. I write to you. I continue to write to you. This Bible is yours still today. This ever-relevant Bible is yours today. I preach to you. I speak to you. I whisper in your ear by the still small voice of the Spirit. I love you. I care for you. I forgive you. I am pleased that you're seeking to forgive others who've sinned against you. You're mine. I want to assure you of that. I write to you because your sins are forgiven you. And have something to say that so you can live another day and forgive another day, and be forgiven another sin. Seventy times seven times a million. And isn't that a great thing? The world of unforgiven, and because they're unforgiven, they just act as unforgiven people do. They hold grudges, or if they show some kind of mercy, it's some government handout, whatever it is. But there's no real forgiveness. But in the world of the forgiven, that's the church, there's this divine communication, so we start to talk to one another. That's what happens. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I speak to you, honey, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I speak to you, my dear husband, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I speak to you, brother. I speak to you, sister. I speak to you, friend. I speak to you, fellow sinner. I love you. I reach out to you because of the forgiveness of the gospel. This is how we live, to forgive. This is why we live. We're forgiven. Go in peace. Amen. 
Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would bless us with the forgiveness of sins and a forgiving spirit, the spirit of Christ, that we may know the worth and the power of the blood of the cross in our own lives, cleansing us from every sin and seeking that others might be cleansed with us and reconciled to us. Lord, here we are, your agents, your agents of salvation, and we pray that you would bless your agents of salvation, us, members of the body. Prepare us also to partake of your supper on the Lord's Day next week, God willing, and all this week to show that we are the forgiven, that world of the forgiven, the Church of Christ. In his name we pray, amen.